welcome to Home and Unleashed, a podcast about coming home to ourselves, featuring conversations with special guests on topics related, but not limited to burnout, mindset, fulfillment, transitions, wellness, and so much more. I am your host, Jessica Locke, Astrala Yoga Guide and Holistic Wellness Coach. And this podcast is not about telling you what to do. I believe we all have the answers we need within. This podcast is here to inspire you, help you find clarity, and maybe give you an extra nudge towards living wholeheartedly. And of course, we'll be sharing tools and strategies from our guests to embrace your inner wisdom and live unleashed. Ready to dive in? I am so excited to introduce today's special guest, the lovely Tara Stiles. She's become a dear friend and mentor in the past couple of years. Tara Stiles is a global yoga movement and wellness expert, author and founder of Strala Yoga. She was named Yoga Rebel by the New York Times. Tara brings a revolutionary approach to being, moving, and healing to inspire millions around the world with her relatable perspective to yoga, meditation, exercise, awareness, nutrition, and everyday well-being. Through her books, including the upcoming Clean Mind, Clean Body, and both in-person and online classes, Tara offers an important reset button, providing tools, guidance, and immersive experiences in mental and physical self-care to transform daily routines and habits and ease into our wellness where we can truly feel and be our best selves. Tara lives in Brooklyn with her husband, Mike, and their daughter, Daisy. In today's episode, Tara shares how her dance journey led to yoga, the resistance she encountered Astrala Yoga Guru, the ripple effect that came along with it, in a way helping trigger a movement on ease and softness, how sometimes drinking green juices is not enough, how to stay in our center to set better boundaries, the importance of defining why you want to be of service so you don't get swept up in the noise, and how carving time to make space for herself helps her stay in the flow. Are you ready to dive in? Hello, hello. Hi, how How are you? Did that work? (laughs) Yes, it worked. Oh my God, thank you so much. Of course, it's so good to see you. I'm so excited to do this. Oh, thank you so much. uh, If you've told me, if someone told me like five, eight years ago that you would interview Tara, I'm like, no, there's no way. And now you're sitting right in front of me. So thank you for being here. Of course. No, I'm like, I'm so happy to know you. I mean, since even we met at the cafe so long ago in Toronto, but we had just over the years, like, you know, come on. I mean, the pleasure's all mine. Just, you know, you're feel like part of, you know, our, our family and Daisy loves you and she carries around that keychain all the time still. So. <laughs> we just have to take her to Peru now so she knows yeah. where that yeah. is. She has this um, blanket that my grandmother made that has the world map. So I always show her where, you know, people oh. that we know live. So hopefully it'll kind of sink in one day when she can, you know, go again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. can all go again. So. Oh my gosh, she must be missing it too, seeing, being around all the, I guess, all the people. She's grown up with communities with, you know, in your trainings as well. Yeah, yeah, I think so. But yeah, I don't know how much she, I mean, she remembers, but I don't know how much she thinks this is a negative thing or a positive thing. I don't know. We try to just do fun stuff and um, I mean, we talked to her about what's going on. It's not like we're, you know, I don't, nobody knows what they're doing. You know? yeah, <laughs> yeah. I still don't know what's happening. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I remember like telling her about the mask in the beginning and it's like, well, for her, it's just this thing that we do now. Like she's never not known it. So there it is. And she's accepted it. When we go out, we put it on. When you're at home, you don't need it. And, yeah. and there you go. So like she has a cool one with a Pikachu on it. Oh, like that. I want that. That's so cute. <laughs> Yeah, but she'll be happy to see everyone, so. Yeah. yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah. So, so grateful for this opportunity. Um, so you're from Chicago, Illinois. Would you like to tell me a little bit how was it growing up there, some of your favorite memories? Oh, gosh. Well, yeah, I'm from, that's our nearest kind of big city, so I'm from a little bit south of there, um, and that was the big city where we would go and sort of see things and see the world through the lens of Chicago. Um But yeah, I remember growing up, we lived in the country and at the time I thought it was amazing, but I also really wanted to get out and see the world. That was always such a part of my 
my being, I guess. I don't know, just a part of who I am. But I remember being, you know, just barefoot all the time, running around and throwing rocks and water and, and playing with sticks and things like that. And um, I got to dance growing up, which I really loved. And that was something that really took up all of my, you know, before school and after school time since age four through high school. And I loved I love that because it gave me a chance to express myself in some way that was physical. And I think that was very um, probably more mentally emotional, me mentally um, good for me than, than anything else and um, kind of kept me busy in that way. And um, we got to travel around a little bit through dance, through these little kind of corny competitions that little studios would do in the middle yeah. of America. But, you know, we'd go to Chicago and South Carolina and other kind of cities to do these things. So I always thought that was so cool to get to travel and take classes from teachers that were, you know, on Broadway in New York and different um, dance companies. Um, so yeah, I really enjoyed this mix of nature and really kind of being, uh, you know, creative and imaginative and having that open space and then the possibility of there's so much to explore and learn in the world. Right. In a way, you've connected that part of your childhood with Strala Yoga, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny. I think about this now, well, especially this year, because there's more time to reflect and think and all of that. But, you know, growing up, I was always thinking, oh, I'm going to get far away from this and New York and kind of be in the world in that way and leave this all behind. And it really just is the same. I've more taken all of what I've learned growing up and appreciate now more than I appreciated then and, you know, realized the practices behind that are the practices that I started learning like yoga and then, you know, later Tai Chi with Mike and Shiatsu and thinking, oh, this is the things that I was thinking about as a kid, but had no idea about how to get better at them or that there even was a practice to study or a way that I could relate to other people through the the, the focus of this. And um, yeah, so it's really all feels the same, but I feel grateful to have some language, I guess, to, and a practice to share with people. So it's sort of a reason to be talking to people in a way, <laughs> which, right, right. which makes me feel, you know, satisfied. <laughs> Talk about something, you know. We can do That's something. true. Yeah. And giving it kind of like a framework, because I love we can talk about Australia a little bit more about how it came to be. It was in the middle of New York, kind of like the city that never sleeps. Yeah. Australia come come up as like kind of like the antidote to all the busyness, to the pushing and forcing, or it was something like a compilation of your childhood experiences growing up. Oh, I think it was subconsciously everything I learned growing up, but more what was in the front of my mind was yoga is amazing. And I was learning yoga but also I felt like there was this busyness of yoga or stressfulness or, you know, even a lot of people in New York would go to their yoga and try to do it, do the yoga perfectly instead of just relax at yoga. And it sort of became this, you know, whether the teacher is telling you to be competitive or it's coming from your own inner voice. Um, you know, I was really aware of the sandwich of you're not doing it right. You're not doing it right. Yeah. <laughs> and all of this sort of the stress of that, mental and physical feeling um, being a big part of the experience of yoga. And I thought this just doesn't feel right. And um, yeah, so I started, you know, just leading classes and, and talking to people really about, um, you know, how great yoga is and how it doesn't have to be something that makes you feel like you're not good enough in a way. Yes. It's so, so <laughs> deep. Like it, it resonated with me so much because I, I found Australia Yoga, but I didn't really understand why it made me feel so good until one of the trainings. And it was right after I quit my like corporate job and I spent 25, 27 of years of my life just pushing, achieving, and you know, this is how it should be. So when I went to, you know, the training, it was like, no, you don't have to be rigid. You can get comfortable. What do you mean I can get comfortable? <laughs> what do you mean I can allow myself to be myself when, you know, everybody tells you this is how it should be. And especially with the perception of yoga being, these are the poses, you have to make them perfect. But I think mm -hmm. you and Mike share like you don't get enlightened or you don't you don't start levitating once you nail a pose and that was <laughs> such a huge kind of like permission to be myself oh. and I'm curious how your background in dancing and how Mike's background in Tai Chi how did it fuse together to become Strala? Oh my gosh well again it was sort of this 
ongoing laboratory effect. And, you know, I didn't really get into the tai, Mike's Tai Chi background from a, this is what he's doing with Tai Chi, you know, really consciously, except that's what he was doing. You know, <laughs> He was just always doing it. And then with, with the yoga, I felt, you know, again, I didn't, I didn't really understand even what I was doing, except that, you know, it didn't make sense to me to lead in Sanskrit just for a few reasons. One, you know, even take away the Sanskrit, just the name of the pose, say in English, like triangle pose. If I just, for me, if I was just to say triangle pose, do it and then kind of adjust and fix and say all the things that, you know, I'd heard other teachers say or done in trainings, then to me, that didn't make sense within staying in the flow or being in alignment before you get into the pose and after you get into the pose and where is the pose anyway. And, you know, dance really addresses that you're never stuck or forced or rigid. And if you are, it doesn't work. You can't move your body that way. And, you know, you can take a picture of dance or you can take a picture of movement and there's definitely, you know, moments that look like they're endpoints, but there really never is a stop, even if you're still. And the more I would talk with Mike about that, he was like, yeah, that's Tai Chi. You know? <laughs> and you know, the more then we met Sam and he's like, yeah, that's Shiatsu. But it's not all of Shiatsu, you know, Sam would also say, you know, he liked to, you know, he was involved teaching a, in a Shiatsu Institute before. And he said a lot of the teachers there would be very rigid with it too. So it's not like Shiatsu is amazing and Tai Chi is amazing, amazing, but yoga is rigid. It's that humans are rigid <laughs> and it's really hard to, you know, get out of the habit and that's more of the practice of it. So I guess for me, I kind of continue to come around of well, I don't need to be mad at everybody for being rigid or mad at yoga teachers for being rigid. It's just, this is how we all end up being. And it's really about being easier on ourselves and, and also realizing that if you're comfortable, you're not lazy. You know, you're, you're addressing yourself, you're honoring yourself, you're paying attention to yourself. And of course, you're going to work hard, but you're working more efficiently instead of, you know, thinking you're getting gold stars for just stressing yourself out. And I think, you know, we're more there now as a society, people are more realizing with, you know, wellness being a word even or being popular um, now that it needs to feel good for you in order for it to work. You know, you can, you can drink all the green juices you want, but if you're stressed out, the green juices won't work in your body. So it's, yeah. so it's the same thing with, with yoga, with, with all of the movement that we do. So, so finally, I feel like, you know, the beginning of, of explaining Strala to people because yoga teachers that were friends of mine would come in and they'd be like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, like, you're just telling people to feel good. You know, they're not going to get anywhere like that. Or, you know, you're not doing anything. You're not teaching anything. And, you know, I, I didn't really care so much about doing it right, but I knew I was definitely on a path of helping people connect back to themselves. And that's how I learned yoga. It wasn't really explained to me like that, but I had, you know, my first class was a really simple teacher in our ballet school. And he was just sitting in the front of the room, happy. And he led us through these postures. You know, it wasn't like a Strala class, but it was like a yoga class where no one was pushing you around. And he was just kind of leading this simply. And, and there it was. And I felt like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And then my second thought was, why doesn't everybody do this? <laughs> was that so. your first, first exposure to yoga class? Yeah, that was my first kind of official um, you know, structured experience with yoga. I mean, before that, it was just, you know, uh, reading books I found at the library on spirituality or, you know, the cosmos, things that would kind of relate to the ideas of yoga. But there really wasn't, at least where I was in the library, there wasn't a yoga section. There wasn't a, the health section was just, you know, diet books, I guess, or, yeah. you know, whatever was going on back then in the 90s. But, <laughs> but there really wasn't, um, even the alternative health section wasn't really um, popular yet to be, you know, showing it was more of these, I guess, reaching um, like my mother's generation of how to stay slim as you are a mom now, you know, and I saw my mom go on all these diets and things like that. And yeah. I thought, okay, something's, something's off <laughs> to come back on. <laughs> yeah, but in the dance school, that was the first time, that was my first experience in a structured yoga environment. So was it a conscious pivot where you, you were like, oh, I love dance, and then you saw yoga, oh, I love it, I'm going to try this out, or it was more kind of like, I'm just going to, it feels good, I like making people feel good, I want to pursue more of yoga, I'm curious about, was there a transition, or it was more like, I'm going to explore all my options? 
Oh, gosh. I mean, yeah, back then, I had no idea that this guy that taught this yoga class did it as a job. I thought he yeah. was you know, some sort of alien sent down to like, teach us yoga. I thought maybe he was the mailman or something. <laughs> I, you know, it would have been ridiculous to my mind to think that it was a job or it was something you could do with your career, you know, even as a hobby, you know, let alone as, um, you know, the main focus of, of, of what you do with your life. So that really wasn't anything that I was thinking of at all. Be just because there was no examples of that around, but I knew it was something, as soon as I took that class, I knew, oh my gosh, I want this for myself, for my life, and I want my friends to do this, and I want the people I know to do this, and let's, I wanted to gather people, then go around with people, and find the places, <laughs> and like yeah. find the teachers, and just, you know, hold hands, and let's all go feel better together, um, so, you know, my ballet teacher gave me a book, Autobiography of a Yogi, and he said, you know, I really, I really see you getting interested in this. Here's a book. And I'm thinking, why would somebody give me a book about this? You know? <laughs> <laughs> what does this mean? How can I go further? So, you know, I just read the book and there was a center on the back of the book in San Diego. So I, I went to the center. I was like 17 years old and just, you know, got a plane ticket and went there, walked around. And, and it was, it wasn't like a yoga studio. There was people looking at big koi fish and things like that. And it was more of an ashram, people sweeping the floor. I guess how you would see an eat, pray, love now. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I just thought this is so strange what's going on. But everybody there was also calm. And it wasn't really about who they were in their lives. It was sort of this moment where people came together and, you know, it didn't matter if they were, you know, successful in the world or not. Everybody was equal in this, in this world. And I thought, this is cool. <laughs> you know, I want to keep finding things like this. <laughs> so yeah, it was never, you know, I never thought about it as a job. And then I, you know, came to New York, was dancing, doing a lot of different things. And because it was something I loved for myself, I just kept talking to people about it that I would meet. And, you know, I'd, I'd, somebody would eventually say, well, show me what you're talking about. You know, I have a headache. And I'd be like, oh, try this and try this. And they'd be, oh, my headache's going away. So it sort of developed as that. I mean, I was invited just by people I would meet to go and do kind of one-on-one -on -one sessions in their home before, before I knew that that was what other people did. You know, I didn't know any yoga teachers really at the time doing that. So I was just kind of you know, like you would, you would grow up and study and learn dance, then eventually you would maybe become a dance teacher. Um, I didn't think of myself as a yoga teacher, but I was just showing the things that I knew. And um, eventually I, I took a yoga class in New York and the teacher had a flyer for her yoga teacher training. And I thought, you can do a training for this. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I was just really behind, but everything was very new, especially with the yoga. There wasn't a yoga industry still yet. Um, so I did her training and then I really loved her. I loved her energy. I loved, you know, she was doing this as a job and I thought, wow, this is really interesting. She has people that she would go and, and, and lead classes to in their homes. And then she would teach at different studios and she had this scooter. She would ride around in New York city. And I thought, this is kind of cool, you know, <laughs> like really quirky and strange. And I've never met anybody like this. Like you're a, you know, some sort of a twinkle character, um, <laughs> So I thought this was cool, but you know, I did her training and it was of this really rigid style now that doesn't exist anymore. And I thought, well, this is cool, but again, it's so stylized. Everybody has their own little way and it seems like not the best fit for me as well. So I took some space after that training and didn't want to disrespect what they were doing, but also didn't want to participate in it either. So just took some space and then eventually just started leading classes and, you know, there eventually more and more workshops became available and I would just go and go to things and check things out. And then meeting Mike finally kind of pushed me over the edge of just, okay, let's start a small studio in your living room. It's bigger than my living room. <laughs> and let's just have some fun as a hobby really. So, you know, never planned for it to be um, anything besides something we would do really at night at 7 p.m. because that's when the people we knew were getting off work. So we just had one class every day at 7 p.m. <laughs> on the yeah. weekends at 11 because that's when people were rolling out of bed. <laughs> yeah. so it started and then people started coming and, you know, uh, we realized then that more people wanted to come and I don't think you can plan much of anything unless people enjoy it. So, you know, the more people that started to like it, the more we got to keep doing it in a way. So... Yeah. <laughs> I love that because you've, 
you're always so open. And one of the things is you being curious. You you do things because you just want to try it out. You're not, you know, you're not like, oh, I don't like how strict yoga is. And you just decide to not do it anymore. It's just, I think it's important to have an open mind and to explore. And especially, I remember you mentioning how um, somebody came into your studio one day and they turned out to be a New York Times reporter and oh, they no. coined you the yoga what rebel which is like oh such a cool name from the outside but was it hard when you know some people in your industry or even your peers were like what the hell are you doing like how did you manage to stay in your center and you know stay with your mission even when people are like what you're doing is weird oh my gosh yeah i mean honestly that now that that that's a long time ago or it feels like a long time ago it was a really stressful time because momentum for our classes were building, people were coming and, you know, the internet started becoming a place where people would go and share what they were doing, not to the degree it is now, but we would just say, we have this class going and people would, oh, share it and then come and things like that. Um, so more people were coming and a lot of yoga teachers would come and be in the front row and just demonstrate all of the things that they could do. And you know, in these kind of passive aggressive ways where I'm gonna do my class just to show you that I don't like what you're doing in your class. And it just kind of felt like, why do we have to do this? You know, there's so, there's so much available. I'm not trying to harm anybody, but, but also I was speaking out um, vocally against what I saw as abuses in the yoga community that turned out now, like this year, last year, five years ago, to be actual crimes and things like that. And I, you know, I think, I, I don't think I'm a whistleblower, but I, I would definitely say that doesn't look right to me. This feeling in this environment doesn't look right to me. I don't think you should go to that guy's house. That doesn't look right to me. You know, so I would say these things to, you know, just community members in yoga that I knew. And I was always, I always felt like, um, people were telling me that I didn't, I didn't know enough about what they were doing, or I wasn't sort of in the inner circle. And that's sort of why. And, you know, so I just felt like, well, I'm going to share yoga in this way. And there's already so many different styles. So I'm just going to be over here doing this. And anybody that wants to come is welcome. So Strala really became a place not for yoga people, but for people that either had a bad experience with yoga or people that had never tried it, that heard of it and just didn't identify with the things that they thought yoga was then. And I think it really still is. It's still kind of a, a gathering of, of sort of every, every kind of person. You know, we don't really have a, a, a demographic where everybody looks the same. I think that's, you know, really what I'm most proud of is this is about feeling better. And if you want to feel better, you're invited. You know? <laughs> right. And we're just going to try to make it as easy as possible for you to come. And it's not just about that's a mantra or writing on the wall, the style and how we lead the classes has to match that feeling, you know, really move how it feels best for you. And, and I'm really not going to control you. I'm really not going to manipulate you. And I'm really going to be truthful about that. I don't even have to say any of that. So, you know, like we'd never had any decorations in the studio. And that was because I didn't want to tell people what to think about. I didn't want to show people, you know, a Buddha statue and be like, you have to think about this Buddha statue. Or I didn't want to show people, you know, a Nataraj and be like, you have to think about the Nataraj. And I love the idea of just a big, open, clean space so people can feel what they're feeling. And some people would say, you know, this is anti-yoga, you're not decorating with an altar. And I say, well, it's anti if you think that's the only yoga, but I'm also just trying to be, you know, to use a religious comparison, non-denominational, you know, so we can have, you know, a rabbi, a nun, and a student all walk in. <laughs> yeah. And that's really kind of what it started to feel like, um, you know, at least for me, this idea of everybody is there and it's not just everybody's invited, but everybody, all different kinds of people want to be there. So um, that was my original experience of what yoga was. So I don't feel like I created that idea, but I didn't see that idea existing um, in, a, in a space or in a community anywhere else where I could have just jumped in and been a part of that. So I wanted to not be the head of it, but I wanted to just, you know, you know, invite people to something, <laughs> we could do something together. So you know, it's always felt like, you know, it's together, a together project and not really about, you know, me creating something. It's just about, this is what I've always experienced yoga. And, and then Mike comes along and said, that's what I experienced with Tai Chi and Sam is the same. And, you know, most of the people that, that we meet, like you were saying the same thing. It's like, this is always an inner thing of, 
I used to feel this way, but I really identify with being at ease and it makes me feel so much better. So let's find more people to help support us in this kind of way. So that's been really the the same reason then and now always feels the same to me. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, it, it was always your intention. The how might have changed, you know. Now, like you said, there's so many people that are like, listen to your body and all of that. And with Strala growing, that also means a lot more opportunities coming. I'm curious about how you, how do you make those decisions? Because everybody wants to grow. And, you know, nowadays with the internet, there's like, this is how you grow your list. This is how you, and I mean, yeah, they help, sure. But I think it's important to expand from your center, which is something I've seen Strala do. You, it's not like you collaborate with anyone who reaches out to you, even though it's a great financial opportunity. How, what is it? I guess it's a bit complicated, but how do you make the decision to see what's right for you and your community? Oh, gosh. Uh, well, I think going back to the, especially when more people started coming along for the ride and looking for guidance, and then I'm thinking, okay, I, I, I do no harm is always the main mantra. You know, Mike being, you know, medical school dropout, I learned that well. It's <laughs> like, that makes sense to me. And I had good dance teachers and a first yoga teacher was really great. So that was really important to me. And then also seeing a lot of negative examples in the yoga, maybe spiritual community of, of people who say, you know, follow me, follow me blindly. And then there's all these people like following this person around. It just never felt like, I feel like my mom would smack me upside the head if I started <laughs> acting like I'm amazing, <laughs> like that, that kind of a thing. So, you know, I know for me, it's always important that everybody feels like themselves. And if I can share um, maybe a, a blueprint of what I've done or what I've, you know, what other people have helped me do, because I don't feel like I've done anything, you know, in that way. <laughs> and, um, you know, because the one, the main thing that I've learned is when you're, when you are, how you just said so greatly expanding from your center is the right people come to help you at the right times. And that seems so like, you know, almost like mystical and magical manifest this manifest that, but there's some, reality to the fact that when you're really doing something cool and you don't care about you know the result or the end point of it but you're just being responsible with yourself you're not being reckless you know I, I get nervous when people come to training and they're like I'm quitting my job tomorrow and I'm like can you live with your parents <laughs> or do you need to live with us you know <laughs> you know this whole like I don't think there needs to be this goal that's so kind of extreme or reckless in certain ways. But when you really do, like you said, expand from your center and, and improve at what you're doing, you just get more opportunities to do that thing. And eventually that thing, if you're, you know, if you're not living in a reckless way can, will probably support what you want to do. And I, that's, that's definitely happened for me. And I've seen it happen for so many other people. And I've also seen people, you know, not in our community, but people kind of, extend beyond themselves and try to kind of force something to happen and maybe it happens and then they're not happy which is kind of sad you know or maybe it doesn't happen and then they're really not happy so it's sort of you know from my point of view it only works this way and it only works in this way sort of sustainably building yourself or being able to do this kind of with your life with your time and your energy and um, it only works this way in sort of being satisfied and happy every step of the way. So I don't, I don't really think it's a big secret. I just don't think it works any other way. <laughs> yeah, that's beautifully put. You live and embody it. <laughs> I don't know. Try it. <laughs> <laughs> were, they, were there ever moments where it was hard to stay in your center with, you know, noises and people, hey, you know, you're Strella, this is a great opportunity to do this. And you're like, I just, you know, I just want to help people stop trying to pull me in all directions. Like, <laughs> were there ever moments like these for you? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, I think especially after that article came out, um, you know, I think a lot of times for, you know, other people I've talked to, big moments happen when you're not ready. <laughs> you know, it's sort of like, I think about now, oh, if that moment just could have happened three years later, I would have been more prepared. Um, so crazy things started to happen that pulled me in all directions. Like, you know, the Channel 5 news crew would come in and be like filming, you know, somebody's 4 p.m. class. And I'd, <laughs> I'd come in from my class and be like, what's going on? And like, they'd put it online. And then like all these, you know, just 
just, just so many things were happening that I wasn't even aware of. And I felt like that was kind of being swooped up in, you know, uh, you know, like a big wave in a way. And, um, things started to happen that I was excited about that were taking me uh, more in a, more in a, a direction, able to travel and meet the people that were maybe practicing now online. So partnering with Reebok was a great opportunity to, to even come in and just say, I mean, there wasn't, it was just Lululemon at that time and some, some smaller indie yoga brands. So to say, you know, this is a good opportunity for all of us. And what do I have to lose? You know, I can kind of pitch my idea and say, can we make cozy clothes and can we learn about sustainability together and maybe do a little bit there? And you're this giant company, you know, so you're going to be able to send me all over the world. If you want to do that, that's something I want to do. I want to go meet everybody. Um, so let's do this together. So that ended up being a positive thing, but also, you know, it started pulling me in all these different directions, literally, you know, on a plane from here to here and then to there and then back and then there. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, where's Tara now? Yeah, there's just the physical, you know, traveling through space very quickly and doing a lot of things and, um, and just trying to keep up with different things. But then also, you know, I, I did have a lot of time within that to realize this is ridiculous. This isn't real. This isn't going to be my life forever. I need to enjoy this and also make sure that I stay in my own center so I can see the right opportunities to um, match up with people that can help us and, and expand. Um, so that brought a lot of great things like, you know, meeting, meeting friends in Malaysia and Singapore and um, starting the Strala Partner Studio pro program, which I never would have thought of on my own. You know, other instructors started saying, hey, I want to open a Strala. And I'm like, really? <laughs> and they're like, yes, Tara, you know, like, let's figure out how to do this. And I said, well, I don't want to do some sort of cheesy franchise where I'm in charge and I just don't want to, I don't want to be a corporation or have a bunch of people sitting at an office, you know, telling you what to do. So let's figure out a way where, you know, legally we can all do this and I can, you know, you can use the name Strala and somebody next door isn't going to take that from you. So there's, you know, some legal uh, licensing and things like that and trademarks and all these stuff that I just had to kind of figure out. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, things, things move fast when they're going fast. So I think for me, it's, you know, always a balance of, going with that momentum and not slowing it down, but also, you know, being grateful for that momentum, but then also not getting swept away in the, in the tsunami feeling of it all. You know? Right. Right. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. That's of such course, an important yes, sorry, tip. Really <laughs> no, no. So important. I, I think I hear a little bit of your mic. Oh, right, oh, sorry. Right, okay. No, no, that's okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think a lot of people can relate to wanting to get the momentum and then, um, which leads to the perfect question, you know, as a yoga teacher, as a yoga guide, someone who wants to serve, we, you know, we're helpers, we're givers. How do you set boundaries? I think that's such an important conversation. A lot of people are burnt out from teaching too much yoga or just pushing themselves at their own projects because they want to make it happen. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Especially now because everything is just so instant and so distracting in the process of creating. You think, I, I mean, I feel lucky also. I come from a different time <laughs> that wasn't here yet. You know, it was, I was, I was able to take advantage of YouTube being at the beginning of it when people were like, Oh, that's for cat videos. What are you doing yoga there for? <laughs> you know, that kind of a thing and, and not worrying so much about really anything else. But, um, but yeah, I feel like, uh, you know, it's important just to, to do the things that make you happy and actually share the things with real people, whether that's digital now or in person and just trust not, you know, I don't mean to say like trust the process, but you're never going to know where it's going. You're never going to know where you're going to be in five years. You can have goals. I mean, I think the best goal is to say, I want to be happy. I want to be doing things that make me happy. Um, and I'm going to get up every day and do this thing that I want to make happen in a way. But to say like, you know, in six months, I want to be teaching yoga full time and have no full time job or, you know, I want to have this many, you know, people doing my online videos or that it just doesn't you never it's never going to be that at all. And I think it's, you know, just really important to always go back to the reason why you want to do the things that you do. And then that will energize you to actually do it in the first place, instead of doing something to be successful at it, doing it because of the reason you're doing it. And I think that's why for me, it always feels like 
you know, 2006 when I'm sharing videos <laughs> or 2000 when I first moved to New York and I'm like, Hey, like yoga helps you feel better <laughs> you <know? laughs> yeah. because that's how I feel now. And that's my, I guess, why, or my mission is always to, you know, share yoga and, and all of these practices that I've learned in a way that helps people feel better. And that doesn't need to be everybody's mission, but everybody has a reason. And the more people that I meet, the more I realize there's, uh, you know, there's, there's never the same reason. You could even say, I want to help p- people feel better too, but you have a different reason for doing that than I do. You know, and my reason mm-hmm. is I'm from a tiny town. People don't have resources like this. I, you know, I just, I couldn't wait to get out because I didn't see myself growing and expanding there. And I didn't want to see people go through the things that I saw my friends go through. And that's, that motivates me every day. I'm like, oh, I, I don't want somebody to feel like, they're in a crappy relationship. They're, you know, 18 years old and that's going to be their life. So when somebody messaged me on the internet about that, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's going to be okay. <laughs> so like, that's not, I, that person's not going to give me a hundred dollars, you know, but like that's, it doesn't matter, you know? So I think finding your reason why you want to help people, if that's your reason, it's so essential and you know it, it's not like you have to do a journal exercise on what's my reason, but it's just really sitting with yourself and being like, what am I doing and why am I doing it? And then it may take you completely out of the thing that you're trying to do and take you somewhere else. And that's what, I mean, that's, I got taken out of dance and I was like, this was my life. You know, that's what I love. And the one reason, the one problem I had with dance was the only people that get to come to see dance are the people that can come to the theater. And that was my whole problem with, you know, growing up how I grew up. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm repeating this problem I have. I want everybody to be invited. I want everybody to come to the stage. So with yoga, it's like dancing with the people for me. It's like that for me. Like that's why I love, even online, you know, a lot of people say to me, oh, it's so hard to create this connection with people online. And if you, if you create a good connection with yourself and you, you, you know, who's there, if it's in a zoom or whatever, or maybe it's just like a couple blips on a screen, but you can imagine the other people there and then you're there. Boom. So for me, that's again, fulfills that need or that desire that I've had, you know, really to, to express my whole life. So I think that's, you know, I think really that's the key to, to staying happy while you're pursuing your, your goals, you know, because you're going to have goals anyway, even if you try not to, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you want to have that thing, or you want to have that house, or you want to live here, you want to have that relationship. And I think that's all normal. You know, it's like part of being human. So yeah. oh, I could, you know, I have so many quotes, like every time I go to astrology training or just talking with you, I'm like, <laughs> let me write it all down. So I'm grateful that it's recorded because it's, it's so important. And you brought out such an important part point that it has to energize you and I think a lot of times we forget we want to do something so logically like we're doing it but does it still energize and I think that might be a good way to check am I still in my center (laughs) especially when it comes to boundaries or anything else like oh you know you talk about the center a lot and what are some practices that you you practice tools you use every day to kind of come back to your center whenever there are things that might try to pull you out oh gosh yeah I think it's you know, a, a practice I learned actually through that time when I first started getting busy, I guess, because before that, like nobody cared. So I had all the time in the world, which I think is a wonderful time. So if, if anybody is in that time when you're just trying to get it going, that's amazing. That's never going to happen again because eventually people are going to say, I want to do that with you too. And then it'll just be different. It'll change and you'll be sort of on a different part of your path. But, um, you know, for me, it's creating actual moments with my time and with my space that make me feel like it's, you know, 1999 all over again. So (laughs) (laughs) whether it's like, you know, turning off the phone for a little bit, or, you know, I have, I, you know, it sounds so corny, but you know, if I'm leading class in the morning for online, I'll have Mike kick me out of bed a little bit earlier, which I hate because I hate getting up like super (laughs) early, but I'm like, just kick me out of bed and then I'll be up and then I'll do my own just wander around. It's not even like, oh, I do my 10 minutes of yoga before yoga. (laughs) (laughs) I just feel like that's not always realistic for me. It's not always what I want to do, but if I can just be awake for an hour before I do the thing that I do, then I just have time to literally do nothing. So the things that need to come up for me that I need to process can come up. So whether it's 
wow, I really don't want to write another book again, or wow, I can't wait, wait to write another book again, or I have this idea for this project, or I really want to do this thing with everybody, or I just need a month where I talk to no one, that I can actually think of that instead of having it be an intellectual sort of outside in decision, it becomes that, oh, this is what I need to do right now for myself. And, and, and always the thing that I decide to do that's right for myself is the right thing for everyone around me too. It's like, oh, finally, this is a good idea to go to the country right now. And Mike's so happy and like, <laughs> <laughs> he's running around. So, you know, those kinds of things that you kind of need space for the idea to come in, I think, instead of just, um, you know, thinking it through just intellectually or just goal wise. It's just that kind of do nothing time that's, um, at least for me, necessary. Mm, I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to share a quote that I, I think it was from one of the trainings. Um, and maybe you can expand on it. Yeah. What you give to other people is always what you have in your own body, your own life. Words only make sense and have a real impact when they agree with who you are and what you're doing. So a good teacher isn't telling people what to do. They are embodying what to do. Oh, yeah. I mean, I learned that one the hard way, just like we all do, <laughs> hopefully, because, you know, people are a mirror for what you're doing all the time. And, you know, I love looking at this in life. And Sam's actually helped me so much with this because, you know, he just walks down the street because he works with bodies so closely with shiatsu and he thinks about it in that way specifically when you walk with him he's always like i wonder what's going on with that person's right shoulder and then i'm thinking why do you care <laughs> I'm thinking, oh that's so interesting because if they're walking around with that shoulder then it means that something's going on and then why aren't they relaxed here so it makes me think about myself and what what the heck am i doing right now <laughs> and, you know if i look back when i first started leading yoga, I was so excited and I would take that excitement and kind of, you know, I don't think I was hurting anybody, but I would be really forward in my energy and I'd be like, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> and I noticed that, you know, it, it brought together people that were also kind of buzzing on that same mindset, like, okay, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. And there was no balance there. <laughs> we were all just excited, which, you know, I think is great and wonderful and awesome, but it really showed me, I think, for the first time that, oh my gosh, like, you know, it's not that I'm telling these people what to do, but if I'm in a, if I'm in a group that where I'm doing these things, other people are going to do these things too. It's just like, you do what your friends are doing and mm -hmm. you don't even need to be in a leadership role in a group for that to happen. You know, I've always, you know, since I realized this, you know, walking around outside or like seeing people in conversation kind of mirror each other with their hand gestures and see what people do. And I'm like, oh, this is so everywhere. So I noticed for me, that was such a huge information in, 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 in my own leading, but also in sharing, you know, when I would see people try to learn how to teach yoga really well, and you're going to learn how to teach yoga really well when you're learning how to teach yoga. But the main thing is being aware of your own habits and what's happening with you and also knowing that it's not like it's not bad to have bad habits we all have them and it's sort of like you have your whole life to just get rid of one bad habit so you become aware of the next one <laughs> Basically. So I think once, once i was able to you know put a vocabulary around that and share with other people like it's all right if you're if your knees hurt it's probably because you're arching your back and if you're arching your back it's you know, I, you're, it's not a judgment of, oh, look at how you're walking. That looks so goofy. It's like your knees hurt. Let's take care of it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so that becomes a whole thing instead of like, well, I like walking around like this because I kind of am used to presenting myself in the world this way. And it's like, well, is it really working for you? You know? Yes. So it's that kind of, it's that kind of self-awareness practice um, that really, you know, takes care of everything. Like you mentioned before burnout, you know, I think it's so easy to get burned out when you're leading if you're in a kind of funky body position and it, it sounds so kind of boring mechanical or anatomy but like literally if you have this idea of who you are and you're expressing it kind of double doing your fingers or your shoulders or your facial expressions you're gonna get tired and the more you can come back to yourself and just do all of the stuff of softening and wiggling all the things that we do the more you come back to your own center and I think we all do these extra things because we want people to 
see us and see how we are and have a good connection. We're trying to make that connection happen. But, and it's a fear of, well, if I just do this, nobody's going to see me and nobody's going to, you know, understand what I'm doing. But in reality, the opposite is true. Once you come back and it's like everybody zooms right in or, whoa, what are you doing? Show me, show me the thing that you're talking about. And, you know, I've seen this, you know, yoga is, you know, sort of how we share, obviously, but I've seen this and just, you know, sitting in on lectures at schools or, you know, seeing people just talk out on the street with each other. It's just, it's everywhere you look. And I think it's, it's such a cool thing to keep in mind, especially if you experience burnout, because it's, it's always because of this, I'm really just trying to do a good job. And unfortunately in that, you know, noble pursuit of trying to do the right thing, we're, you know, we're stressing ourselves out and we're just not balanced in ourselves. Oh, you got cut off. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> I have to, uh, oh my gosh. I have to get Mike. I think. Oh oh I think gosh. the camera is taking a break right now. <laughs> the camera's taking a break. Let me text him. So sorry. It's okay. Um, it happens. It's life. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, camera. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm going to find it. I didn't know. Gosh. Of course, we're always trying to improve our equipment around here. <laughs> no, I, I, it's like the perfect way to summarize the metaphor. The camera's like, let me do it for you. <laughs> oh my God, do you mind if I just run and get him real quick? Yes, please, please. Okay, I'll be right back. No worries. Thank you. Okay. Okay, okay I'm back. He's running upstairs to get the <laughs> second battery. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. <laughs> Sorry, now you have to edit you know, or something. Oh, my oh it's, gosh. I might just leave it in because it's, you know, it, it happens. These things happen. And totally. We can think about, you know, especially if we're now, I think it's important to have a compassionate lens. And I love how you talk about how, you know, it's a noble cause. You want to do great things. But yeah. then, you know, sometimes you forget about taking care of yourself, which. Yeah, we're uh, changing the camera battery. Yes, thank you. Mike, yeah, I want to say hi to you before you run away if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh my gosh Mike's just he's turning the camera around I wish we had a behind the scenes on this <laughs> what's happening is Daisy I'm taking a nap I'll make you a little video just for fun <laughs> oh my gosh. it'll just take a second this is so cool I get to see like the behind the scenes <laughs> yeah oh my goodness 2020 Yes, 2020, the longest year ever. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay, are we back? Welcome back. Yay. Yes. <laughs> that was a perfect intermission. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. Everybody grab the popcorn. <laughs> yeah, get some stretches in a way. <laughs> totally, totally. I want to talk about your latest book. Clean oh, mind, clean so body. Nice. It's coming out soon. I remember you share how it felt different this time compared to other books that you've written in the past. So two questions. What is um, clean mind, clean body about and why was this time different? Oh, gosh. Well, the, the sort of reason for it was, you know, a lot of what we were talking about before is just simply noticing over the last, you know, 10, 15 years, wellness becoming from, from sort of not existing or, you know, being an alternative thing kind of on the side to this huge industry that we're all stressed out about as an industry and as um, how to do it really well. And just seeing, seeing myself and seeing, you know, friends of mine stress out about, you know, doing yoga correctly, doing, you know, the eating properly, doing the meditation properly and being so busy with the wellness stuff. But, um, you know, not, not to be like, we're missing the point, but to maybe give ourselves a little bit of a break and to give ourselves a little bit of, of time to rewind a little bit and look at all of the ancient wisdoms that exist and say, they're here, you have a lifetime to learn about them, but don't lose yourself in the process. And, you know, I think so much of my own kind of looking back, coming to New York and learning about yoga, um, I remember learning about Ayurveda and then kind of stopping because I, I kind of misunderstood that you needed to become a professional Indian chef in order to do Ayurveda. And I said, well, I don't have time for that. I'm just going to put a bookmark in that and maybe do some green smoothies and, you know, I'll come back to that later, you know? So I think, you know, it's really important to, to take all of these ancient wisdoms and, and learn about them, but also 
realize that, you know, just like yoga, I've, I've realized works only when you feel like yourself, all of the other things only work when you feel like yourself. So, you know, asking people that we know who are Ayurvedic experts, do you have to, you know, get a degree in Indian cooking to do Ayurveda? And I felt like I was going to get kicked out of the wellness community for even asking that question. And, you know, every expert told me, no, what your, whatever your grandmother and your own culture is doing whatever dishes they're preparing, or maybe your great grandmother, maybe you need to go back a few generations, somebody who's living sort of with the arc of the day more simply, you know, you'll find a lot of inspiration there. And then you can take the, the science from where it came from and, um, and, and learn some things about the Indian culture, but you don't have to kind of culturally appropriate in order to do these things, which was why I kind of had so many um, steps back from yoga and from uh, from from all a lot of these East Asian principles as a person in the world. I'm like, well, you know, my mom's gonna like look at me funny if I put a bindi on my head. Like that doesn't seem natural. <laughs> <You know? Right. laughs> yeah. So you said that this process was different, or the launch of this book was different than the other books that you've done. Did something shift, or it's just I guess applying everything you've learned. Yeah, I think that the shift is, it really feels like an expression that I'm, uh, that I feel will, will, will be good for people in a way. And, you know, in this way that I felt with sharing yoga, you know, in the beginning and now where I love doing it, and if people want to come for the ride, that's great. Um, I really kind of have somehow that same feeling about this, about this book. You know, I know people want to feel better. Um, there's no gimmick to it. You know, it's not like, hey, learn this thing. <laughs> you know, it's sort of, I've done 30 the research. 30 days guarantee. <laughs> yeah, it's sort of, there's, there's things to do in the book. There's practices, but, you know, I really think it's unique in its offering of going through these ancient um, practices and, and looking at them through the lens of your life right now. And I think there's been so many, um, you know, books and trends and years about taking these things and kind of hacking them for our lives or making them, you know, in, in five minute things or, you know, just, just doing a little bit here and a little bit there. And, you know, I, I don't think that we've been satisfied with that because it doesn't feel like us and it's not sustainable. So, you know, I, I feel happy about it because it's a sustainable thing and it's sort of matching a sustainable, um, I guess, moment in my life too. <laughs> I can't wait to read it. It's coming out. Is it a December? What date? 29th. 29th. Oh, right yeah. before New Year's. Perfect yeah. like Christmas gift. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> a couple more questions sure. before we wrap up. What has Daisy taught you? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Is this a long one? <laughs> so wild. Oh my gosh. Um, so many things. Well, you know, maybe there is some truth in that you get, you know, the people around you are the people that you need. I thought, oh, she'll be this calm, chill person. <laughs> no, she has so much energy. And I knew from the moment she was born, she was always like tracking with her eyes and just always sort of really present and calling you out on whatever, you know, you're, you're doing that doesn't match up with what you're saying, you know, always asking questions, um, you know, just just full of energy in this way so she's really taught me you know how to conserve my own energy so i can match her in a way i don't think that's like super unique to like <laughs> other three-year-olds and mom's experiences <laughs> but um yeah she's really taught me to to you know to be present with her and to enjoy and to you know and to not be distracted you know i think it's such a big priority that i always remind myself of because it's so easy to slip into it of just distraction through busyness and you know I have a certain amount of time that I have with her and a certain amount of time where Mike's with her or she's sleeping that I can you know do things like talk with you or you know write books or do yoga classes so it's sort of you know being really present with both is is has been a new thing I used to just have all the time in the world you know to just hang out <laughs> that's what I hear from every parent they're like you will have less time than you think you do right now it's a good tip it's to time, know. but it's also like, I feel like the time is so much better because at least for my experience, because I, you know, I wonder what I did with all that time back then. And now I get, I don't know if I get more done with the time that I have, but I'm definitely more focused. And I think that's like a good, that's a positive thing that I can apply. I don't feel like I'm, I'm wanting more time alone in a way. So just kind of nice. Yeah. It kind of helped me be more productive. <laughs> <laughs> 
Beautiful. Um, two more questions. Um, what is the best compliment you've ever received? Oh my gosh. So, <laughs> oh, I tell Mike, it's like, you know, part of the, the thing walking down the street in any city and, you know, I'm not like Julia Roberts or something. So people don't come up to me every two seconds. Um, but there was a young girl uh, who was probably like 15 in New York and she saw me and she started like crying and her mom was with her and she, her mom was like, why, why is my daughter making me cry? <laughs> who are you? How do you know my daughter? You crazy lady. And her daughter was talking about herself and she started telling me about her problems, you know, with, with her body and with her self image. And she actually read, um, I think it was make your own rules diet and this connection with food and all of these things. And she was doing, I think yoga with my YouTube videos. And she was kind of, we were having this really intense conversation on the street with her mom there. <laughs> <laughs> like what is happening? Was, she was telling me that she was so happy to meet me to tell me that I helped her find herself again. And then her mom turned and that was really satisfying and really, I think, you know, really made me feel happy that she had found herself again and you know wasn't wasn't that I did that for her but even the way she worded it was so beautiful and then her mother turned stopped being mad at me for a moment <laughs> and turned to her and said why didn't you tell me about this what's going on so I think you know they had this moment together which you know reminds me of you know so many of our growing up we don't share the, the our hardest things with the people that care about us the most so that was something that made me so happy that I saw them walking away and having this conversation. I'm like, Oh my gosh, this is so cool. You know, I feel like whenever people do know who I am out there in the world, there there's always a story about them and not about me, which I think is so beautiful. So I love, you know, if somebody comes up to me, I'm like, I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait. Tell me. You know? And just then, like, you know, sometimes they're like, can you take a picture of me and my friend? And I'm like, Oh, <laughs> You don't know who I am. Oh. Really cool. <laughs> that was totally me when we first met. I walked up to you. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so nervous. I see her sitting across from me. Her workshop is tomorrow, but should I say hi now? And my sister, she's like my biggest supporter, Erica. She's like, you know, you want to say hi. I'm like, but I don't want to disturb them. Like they're having lunch here. So I just like, my shoulders were up to my ears. I'm like, hi, you're Tara. And my, but Tara, oh my God. I'm like, because I've been practicing your videos for so long and had your first book. I'm like, ah, oh. like, and I, I blacked out. I think that's the only thing I remember. It's so good because I, I noticed you looking over and I told Mike, I said, they just want me to take a picture of them. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, he's like, they don't, they don't know you. They want you to, yeah, they just want you to take a picture of them having lunch at this cafe. And <laughs> so we were like having a moment about you guys too. Oh no, and you saw so us too. I was excited that I was going to get to know you at the workshop and everything. So yeah. yeah. So grateful for that. <laughs> Happy to know you too. <laughs> Final question. What does coming home to yourself mean for you? Oh, my gosh, that's a big one. I, you know, I guess for me, coming home to myself would be checking in with how I'm doing, you know, with the whole thing, mentally, physically, emotionally, everything. And as often as I can, you know, not just when something goes wrong. So, you know, having that moment, you know, in the morning before I have to do anything to just be there and say, what's going on? <laughs> you know, any, anytime I'm, I'm a, a lack for a word, I just think of Marvin Gaye, what's going on? <laughs> you know, or Lauren Hill, everything is everything. You know, you don't have to look far for all of these reminders of, you know, to check in with yourself. And I think that's, for me, it's always that process of, okay, what's going on right now today? And how, how am I feeling? What's happening? And now, okay, well, I know enough of what to do and what, what of those things do I need to do in order to, to balance out in that way? Thank you. <laughs> I love it. Like just talking to you always feels so good. <laughs> and I, I hope- <laughs> I hope the people listening are un as inspired as I am. Where can they find you now? I know you also have a wonderful app, Strala Home, where they can practice with you almost every day. Every day, actually. They can see you anytime. <laughs> I am available. Um, <laughs> I love that. I mean, yeah, especially with, with the app, it's, you know, we have this 10 year of videos and all of these things to do, but I thought, you know, I really... I really just want to be with people every day. That's what I want to do. So yeah, we're there on the app and 
that's cool. And you know, it's the internet now. So I'm really easy to find on social media and terrastyles.com and strawyoga.com and, and all of the, the places that people find each other these days. <laughs> Amazing. Maybe they'll run up to you. <laughs> yeah, please talk call. to me. <laughs> yeah, actually, it's, I get kind of sad, you know, not that this happens a lot now because there's, you know, we're, we're not out that much, but I get sad if I come home and somebody messages me, I saw you here, but I didn't want to say hi. And I was like, oh man, <laughs> that would, let's go meet up and have a coffee and say hi. Yeah. So yeah, if anybody sees me on the street and knows who I am, you know, please come talk to me because I'm lonely. <laughs> uh, yes, that's your invitation. <laughs> Yeah, it's just nice to it's nice to have conversations about feeling better with people and I for me that's something that's you know it always it always does help. So yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much Tara for your generosity, your kindness. You're always sharing, giving so much. I'm so so grateful. Seriously, oh for making this happen. <laughs> of course. Yeah, I no, thank you for everything. You're the best. Oh, we'll talk very soon. Yeah, we'll talk soon so much for listening to the whole and unleashed podcast what was your takeaway from today's conversation let me know in the comments or review on itunes i would love to hear from you subscribe to get new episodes each week and visit wholeandunleashed.com for more information